this workshop has been made possible through a WA Waste Authority grant and also by the very um, wonderful generosity of our speaker today, Andy Gulliver. Andy has a successful 35 year career in mushroom farming and the composting industry. His responsibilities have covered uh, research and development, production and marketing, and he has held director positions in SMEs, large companies and industry associations for over 25 years. And he's currently director of Seawise, a company that recycles a wide range of organic wastes from farming and the community and manufactures composted products for a range of applications, including sustainable agriculture, rehabilitation and bioremediation. Andy was recently honoured with an AORA Legend Award by the Australian Organics Recycling Association at their conference in Sydney for his years of dedicated service and achievements in the field. Please give Andy a warm welcome. Thank you, Jeremy. Well, thank you very much. And look, it's, it's a pleasure to be here. And I guess my job is to give you a little bit of uh, light relief in a busy working day and maybe stretch out minds a bit. I might even say something you don't agree with, and that's good, because that would give us something to talk about over lunch. Um, so that, and, and my passion has become uh, carbon in the soil and the role that carbon plays in sustainable farming systems. And so I'll... Um, I'll just check technology. And so I'll, I'll throw some ideas at you today, which make you think about the role of carbon, maybe the role of soils. We had a chat earlier about food security, and actually I think people are becoming more interested in what they put in their mouths and how that affects human health. But the way that food is produced also has an implication on the health of the planet. So how do we tie all those things together? And I'll try and run a few ideas together today to help us put some of that into, into a context. So what the sorts of things we'll cover. And when I talk to farmers and grower groups, I've, um, I went back over 100 years of history to try and what is it that we used to know that we've kind of forgotten along the way. <coughs> And more recently, I've added the 10 years, the last 10 years have been such a stag seen a staggering increase in our knowledge and the biotechnology that we have at our fingertips. But I think it's worth actually thinking about what is, what's on the new horizons. So we'll, we'll cover why is soil carbon good, how did you get there, how can it help me, how can we manage it, and maybe something a little bit different. The age of biology is coming, I believe, and a word that you can take home today, most of you probably already know this word, but the microbiome. For those of you who are not familiar with it and want to impress someone at dinner tonight, you can talk about the, the microbiome. So why is soil carbon good? Okay, well, in that hundred years of history, I'll talk about what did Cutler say, and what did Kellogg say, and Roosevelt even, and uh, more contemporaries, Ross Gar our own Ross Garner, what did he say just a few years ago? And whatever it is that we say, and whatever it is that we think, if you're in farming and food production, there actually are no easy answers. There is no silver bullet. So people hold me up to be a composter and, and somehow I've got this magic answer. But I don't have a magic answer. All I've got is one tool in the farmer's toolkit to help manage uh, a productive farming system better. A one tool in the toolkit. And the, the job that we have when we're working with farmers and growers is to align all these thinking and so it's all pointing in the same direction. And maybe that's part of our role is to facilitate the lining up of knowledge and enable people to make better decisions. So if we go back to the role of carbon, now most of the people in this room are probably done biology at, at, uh, at secondary school, and you all know that we're all carbon-based life forms. Everyone in this room is a carbon-based life form. So it's pretty important. And that the earth is surrounded by this thin layer of, of earth, of, of soil, and that the planet has this fantastic way of harnessing solar power. And it's called photosynthesis. And plants capture the energy from the sun 
and they actually store that in the plants or the roots and they transfer that energy as an energy store into the soil and that energy drives all living processes. Bar maybe a bit of algae that grows somewhere and so on, but generally all our energy that we harness from the sun gets transferred to us via plants. And that thin layer of topsoil supports all life on Earth. A pretty fragile system when you think about it. So, we think about why soil carbon is important. And, and what I'll do is, some, some of the photos that I use today, they will be examples of work that we have done. So they are practical examples from the real world. So um, the first thing I'd say is that soil carbon affects nearly every soil factor positively. So if you've got a soil that's too dry and you want it to make it wet, soil carbon can help. If you've got a soil that's too wet and you want to make it drier, soil carbon can help. That's a paradox. How can that be? If you've got a soil that won't hold on to nutrients, like a lot of the sandy soils here, soil carbon will help. If you've got a soil that hangs on to too many nutrients, like a lot of the phosphorus locked up in clay, soil carbon will help. So a paradox again. So it's this fantastic mechanism for actually balancing everything out. Um, and an example would be, this is a work done by Chemistry Centre at Maylands Golf Course. You see an immediate soil here with a, a compost product, a control here. This is the, uh, the, the fairway on the third hole. Now in winter, when the golf club members can't play because their ball gets bogged down in the puddles, they're not very happy. So actually having a free draining surface in winter is really important. Now in that case, the value that you get out of an amended soil is this, if you like, the social amenity of being able to play golf. But it really doesn't matter whether the value you get is having healthy food or being able to play around the golf. It's still a, a value proposition. There. So the sorts of things that, that uh, soil carbon will do, supply energy and supports life. It's a sponge and a buffer. So imagine that rainfall falling. Um, yes, by increasing or changing the soil properties, you can allow infiltration to happen rather than puddling. But in that infiltration, you actually allow yourself to harvest that water. So one of the tricks in a drying climate is actually going to be, how do we make every drop count? So whether it's irrigation water or rainfall water, the notion of being able to harvest that water and store it in the soil profile for later use, rather than to have it ponding and running away to waste. Um, that's actually going to be really important. And soil carbon can help that happen. So it acts as a shock absorber as well. So you get this downpour of rain, and you can absorb that water and release it later. But there's also a shock absorber that happens that, say, when you put on a dose of fertilizer, which is a, effectively a chemical salt, that that's actually quite a shock if you're a biological organism like a plant, and you've got this effectively chemical buffer that he buffers the plant. And one of, one of our farmers gave me a great quote. He's a, he's a mad cap Speedway fan. He's, he's in the top three Speedway drivers in the state. So he loves burning, he burns diesel during the day on his tractor, and he burns petrol and nitro at night when he's driving around the Speedway. But he said, this is great, I get it now. He said, it's like a shock absorber on my race car. That, you know, there's, as, as I go around the bumps and so on, it takes the shock away and I can control the car. It's a, the compost is like that in the soil. It just absorbs the shocks and allows the crop to carry on growing. It takes away stress. Another grower said, um, wow, that, that's great. There's less, there's less stress between drinks for my cauliflowers. So in a hot, hot 40 degree days and so on in summer, the growers can only irrigate so many times a day because you've only got a certain amount of physical infrastructure to be able to get around the crop be able to get around to the start to water again, and if you're on a 40 degree day, you can't get around often enough. So eventually the plant suffers stress through wilting, and where they've used compost in the soil, they said, wow, there's no stress between drinks, because you've got that buffer. You've got the extra bit of storage in the soil, and releasing the water to the plant, 
to get it through that next stress. And less stress means a healthier organism. It doesn't really matter whether there's a cauliflower or something in this room. It, it's, uh, stress relates to health. So we've got our shock absorber and creates resilient soils. I think in the next 10 years we'll actually understand what resilient soils really means. And it supports soil and plant health. So the first quote I'll have now is uh, Cutler from 1908. And uh, he said, the depletion of the soil humus supply is apt to be a fundamental cause of lowered crop yields. So back in 1908, Cutler and his colleagues said that. So we've known that for a hundred years. And yet our food production systems are not necessarily managed to actually manage humus levels in the soil. And for humus, think about it's a, it's a, a more sophisticated form of carbon. I'll come to the forms of carbon later. But actually managing the soil carbon to have high levels of humus in the soil gives you the soil with all those great properties. And um, a chemistry centre put up this, this diagram years ago. I, I won't go into the detail other than to say chemistry, physics and biology. Managing those things in balance. That's, that's what really managing any system is about. And if we talk about a, an ecosystems type approach, those who've studied ecology will know that you, you take into account you know, the physical, the biological and the chemical factors. And to me, managing a soil <coughs> is very much along those, those same lines, that you have to manage all those things in balance to get the optimum outcomes. I certainly know that in my days of, as, as a mushroom grower that uh, my job was actually to manage this wildlife zoo. It was every bug imaginable wanted to grow in that environment. My job was actually to manage the ecosystem in favour of my organism, which was the cultivated mushroom Agaricus bisporus. And if I didn't, there were all sorts of other organisms that are going to get in and eat it or compete with it. Um, so this idea of managing an ecosystem is something that I guess I uh, brought from mushroom growing into other agriculture and, and horticulture. And what happens in our farming systems is management gets out of balance. And the history from the, the, um, the ironically named Green Revolution of say the 1950s and 60s where uh, uh, pesticides and chemical fertilizers were the salvation of a, of a growing population to actually produce more food um, effectively what we did was we threw our soil management system out of balance into uh, being more chemistry dominated than physics and biology dominated. And I, I make no value judgment about that because if you're a farmer, and farming's a tough game, and someone comes along and says there's a bag of this stuff and you put it out at this rate and it's this easy and stand back and watch compared to the way you used to do it, um, you cannot blame a farmer for actually going down that path. So it is what it is, and um, we effectively have inherited now a legacy of soils which have been changed because of past practice. And we have to ask ourselves the question, is that a practice that is sustainable for the future? And I guess my contention is that I actually don't believe it is. And we are changing the way we do things. So what did Roosevelt say? And, and um, as part of my research in, in looking back through um, uh, a history, I, I went back to Roosevelt's speeches and he said some fantastic things. And, and, um, and this, this one is a classic which you will recognise, I'm sure. It was in the context of the Dust Bowl in the 1930s where farmers in the Midwest of the USA were having to walk off their land. And he said, the nation that destroys its soils destroys itself. Said that in 1937, and you sort of think, well, oh, that's 70, 80 years later. If if we kind of got that, it would be written into a national soil policy. There would be a policy framework that actually protected the biggest asset that we have, which is our productive soil. I would propose that we don't have such a policy framework, and therefore practices which follow a good policy framework. And the status quo, is that acceptable? 
when the biggest export from Australia in 2008 was the, remember the dust storms that engulfed Sydney and the photos of Sydney Harbour Bridge in a red dust storm and the biggest export that year was the tons of top spoil that we exported to New Zealand. And you think, well, it takes decades and decades to create a productive topsoil. Why on earth will we allow that to be eroded away and exported to New Zealand? They're very grateful, I'm sure, but it's really not what we should be doing with our most valuable resource. So if we think back to carbon, so where is it? Now, I don't intend to get into a lot of debate about a lot of numbers about carbon, but clearly there's a lot of carbon in the air, CO2. It's a basic ingredient of photosynthesis. And if you think about plants, there are basically um, two ways that plants can have carbon in the living material and the dead material. So think about a wheat plant, it's green, it's growing, it gets harvested and you've got the stubble, it's dead. So it's the living and the dead. But there's something more important than the dead, is the very dead, or the humus. And really effectively that carbon pump that we call photosynthesis captures carbon from the air, pumps it into the plant, and the plant actually shares that carbon back to the soil. And they say 30 to 40% of that carbon is actually is exuded through the roots and is the gift that the plants give to the soil. It's the microorganisms in the soil cannot photosynthesize, so they cannot generate energy. So they have to get their energy from somewhere, and they get their energy from the plant. But nature doesn't give very freely without taking something back. So the gift that the plants give, the gift of energy the plants give to the microbes, is returned by the microbes actually harvesting uh, nutrients from the soil in a two-way exchange. Reasonably simple concept but not necessarily well understood in our farming practice that managing that biology and the microbiome of the soil is actually really important for productive soils. And the other sort of carbon is the memory, the recalcitrant stuff. There'll be discussions about charcoal or biochar and so on. I'm happy to talk about that over lunch. Um, and it's just another form of carbon which may have a role to play but I'm really talking about the humus is the, the carbon that I think we need to manage very closely. So soil organic carbon, particularly humus, um, does several things. It plays a key role in a uh, sort of role in all key soil functions. It has high cation exchange capacity, so it holds nutrients in the soil, staggering amount of nutrients. In fact, when you think about a bit of straw goes through a composting process and in composting we're really accelerating nature to create humus. If it goes through a natural process which takes a longer time to form that humus, you think of that humus as effectively this amorphous mix that got lots of little hooks on it that can hang on to nutrients and those nutrients are then like, like sitting on supermarket shelves available for the plant as the plant needs it. And um, and so the managing humus is important in supplying nutrients. Uh, it also improves high water, uh, the water holding capacity, which I talked about before. And the thing about water holding capacity, um, it's not so much the water holding capacity itself, but it's the plant available water. Because if I were to have a, a clay soil or use some sort of magic gel, I might improve my water holding capacity fantastically but it's of little value if that water is not available to the plant. So actually plant available water is, is the critical thing. And th these, these factors result in improved water use efficiency, fertiliser efficiency, pest and disease resistance, and soil and crop performance. And the, the picture there is actually of a cauliflower trial we did many years ago, I think it's back to 2002, where um, This is a treated area, this is a control area. You can see an obvious difference. Uh, when we harvested, um, you can imagine when you harvest a cauliflower crop, you take a team of maybe 12 people through and you do a first harvest, then a second, then a third, then a fourth. And by the time you get to the sixth, seventh, eighth harvest, you're walking an awfully long way between cauliflowers. So it gets less and less efficient. So the cost of harvesting goes up and up. Where, where we um, used uh, compost in the soil, 
but far more crop uniformity, and as I mentioned before, less wilting. But actually, we reduced the harvest to just three harvests. So the labour saving alone was of significant interest to the grower in making, because uh, the first, remember the first rule of sustainability is to be financially viable. So no grower is going to adopt the, my preaching about soil carbon because he wants to save the planet. He'll do it first because he needs to improve his bottom line. So it's always the first rule of sustainability. And it was the grower who said, oh, there's less wilting between drinks. And then when we harvested and we looked at the roots, he said, oh, there's less club root where we've got the compost. And you see there's a, a small difference there between the root mass and when we look, and club root is a global disease of brassica crops, a highly significant disease of brassica crops. And when we looked at the roots, we found there was a difference in root mass, but the incidence of this disease, so the number of spots of club root that we could find was the same in the treatment and the control, but the severity was, di was different. So you can have incidence was the same, the severity was different, and that relates back to that that buffer that I said, you can endure, the plant can endure the same incidence of disease um, occurrence, but it can endure it and withstand it and have a, still have a bigger root mass. So it's not a matter of killing something, and, and these things are often killed with Schedule 7 chemicals and poisons. So we managed to control a globally significant um, disease with the use of zero chemicals. Now that's pretty impressive. Additionally, in this, in this uh, growing system, he would, uh, they used to use methyl bromide, no longer allowed to use it. They still use products like methane sodium, sodium um, partly for disease control, partly for weed control. But that can cost something like $1,000 to $1,200 a hectare. We can actually eliminate that soil sterilant, save them dealing with a nasty chemical, save them another job in their crop cycle, and save them $1,200 a hectare. So all that can go to offset the cost of incorporating composting products. So an economically viable solution, but something that actually works. And don't forget the biology, but I will come back to that. So where do composted products fit? And uh, this will be a very brief uh, session on composting that Bear in mind, when we say compost, I'm not talking about home garden compost. Uh, that is a un relatively uncontrolled environment. That uh, manufacturers today have uh, systems which are ISO 9001 accredited, so that's a manufacturing process. So in the same way that the chemical manufacturers, you know that when you buy a drum of chemical or fertiliser, you know the analysis, you know it's reliable, you know what you're going to get. Composted products need to be the same. That you need to know that you're going to get a reliable performance outcome out of that product. And manufacturers have moved towards that now. And, if, and you think about, I'd like to think about it like a carbon concentrate. Imagine that, that stubble of wheat that I said, dry stubble in the paddock. And people say, well, oh, wow, well, I've got two tonnes a hectare of stubble, that's carbon, that's, I'm adding carbon to my soil. But actually it's sitting there, just standing up and it will oxidise, it will almost disappear. That same stubble, when we take it into our composting process, you might start with 100 cubic metres of product. By the time you're taking it right through the process, you've actually concentrated down to maybe 20 or 30 cubic metres, so you've had a 70% shrink. Now part of that shrink is the energy, remember this is a biological process, composting is a biological process, so we need to feed the bugs. The energy comes from the carbon. So we sacrifice some of that carbon in feeding the bugs. So some of that 70% loss has been consumed by the bugs. But we then also transform that carbon. So it's no longer a stem of wheat. It's actually our job is to generate humus. And humus is the powerhouse of the soil. So it's not just this kind of straw that's been somehow cooked and made nice and fuzzy. It's actually be made a known product with a known performance. And the, um, you know, the 60 second lesson on uh, the compost is that you need the correct ingredients and the recipe, 
the physical structure's got to be right because it's a living process, so you've got to be able to get oxygen through it. The carbon and nitrogen ratio uh, is critical. Blending and moisture right up front has got to be perfect. And then monitor the process, just like any, any process, needs process control and monitoring. We must go through a high temperature pasteurization, so any pests and diseases which came with the ingredients need to have been killed off. Um, and, we're, and the real job is converting that organic matter to humus, because humus is the powerhouse of the soil. And to give you some idea of how that works, in Broadacre, we, we had, a, we had a, a grower come to us once, he said, I want you to palletise your compost site and put it down the tube of an air seeder and put it right next to my cereal grain. And we thought, oh, palletise, and that might compromise the biology and, and, and the heat of compression might kill the bugs off. And, and we said, oh, we're not sure we can do it. He said, you're not listening. He said, I want you to palletise and put this, I put it down my tube of air seeder. We said, oh, I don't know how to do it. He said, you're not listening. I want, he <laughs> said, oh, we get it. You're the customer. We have to listen. So we went through a process and are developing a product um, that we could actually put down the tube of an air signal. And we did a series of trials. And that idea of precision agriculture, where you highly target what it is you're trying to do, we effectively wrote on the back of that. And in, instead of using large volumes of product, we use a small amount of product right next to the, the cereal grain. After several years of trials, we could say then, not that you should no, not that you could reduce your fertiliser by 50%, but that you should reduce your fertiliser by 50%. Because if you use the conventional amount of fertiliser, we found that it actually compromised the mycorrhizal fungi, which we were actually encouraging by having the biological farming system. So in fact, we found the biological on switch to work at the very precise locations. Now, in the cauliflower crop, we may have used 20 cubic metres a hectare. Now, 20 cubic metres of product per hectare is a layer, two millimetres thick, so a matchstick thick. And you think, oh, how can that work? But it works. In Broadacre, they could not afford to use that much. When we palletised in precision place, we used 50 kilograms of product per hectare. That's two bags of hectare. And that's just stunning. That's totally outside of conventional wisdom, way outside of what anyone will ever talk to you about in terms of, of conventional farming practice. So effectively we found a biological on switch and that's the power of humans. So, back to why do soil carbon levels reduce so, sorts of things that cause it? Uh, overuse of fertilizers breaks down carbon. Nitrogen and phosphorus, you know, they're, they're primary limiting factors for microbes. So when you put extra nitrogen and phosphorus on, you promote the biology, great stuff. But the biology needs an energy source. You've given it the nutrients. Where does it get the energy from? It takes it from the existing carbon in the soil. So actually you are sacrificing that carbon and it's been used for the energy for the bugs and it's going up the atmosphere. Um, the drying and wetting cycles cause a boom and a bust. A bare ground and tillage. You know, I mentioned oxidation before. That, that um, two tonne a hectare of, of wheat stubble is left standing there it effectively just oxidises and disappears. And I don't know how many of you have ever used, say, a, a, a shredded up garden waste as a mulch. And then you go back next year and you say, well, I'm sure I put three inches of mulch down there and it's all gone. Where did it go? It couldn't have all blown away, but it has gone. So where did it go? And it didn't necessarily get consumed by worms taking it inside. It did actually oxidise and the power of the heat, and the sun, water, um, and, just, and that's the phys physical and chemical processes that actually make that carbon go back to atmosphere, as the CO2. So effectively, it's an uh, burning is an oxidation process. So effectively, um, a mulch exposed to sun is a slow burning, it's a slow oxidation. So what did Kellogg say? Back to, back to our history. In 1936, he said, generally, the type of soil management that gives the greatest immediate return leads to a deterioration of soil productivity. This was a man who made his money originally by buying, I think it was orchards, buying the poor orchards, 
and realising that if he got some organic matter into the soil, he could turn them into a good orchard, either keep it and be productive or sell it and buy the next bit of land. So he tweaked very early that managing soil organic carbon was important. And he added then that whereas the type that provides the highest income over the period of a generation leads to the maintenance or improvement of productivity, a generation, that's the difference. We tend to think in short cycles. We can't think past three seconds on Facebook or a seven second media grab or maybe this month or this year's profit and loss statement. Yet we actually should be thinking about generations because the soil is a resource that needs to be there for years. And Ross Gein, I, I, I admit that I've quoted him slightly out of context here, but it just amuses me that in 2008, the Garno report, he said the most significant opportunities may be in the area of soil carbon sequestration. So if we knew that in contemporary society in 2008, why am I standing here in 2016 with the diabolical situation that we have with the carbon debate in this country today? Why are we not valuing soil carbon? Why are we not actually rewarding behaviours that grow soil carbon? Yes, because it sequesters carbon from the atmosphere, but actually forget all that because it just makes sense anyway. And yet that whole debate has been distracted by politics and people with a vested interest. But I better stop there. Now the microbiome. The word that I used, I'm just going to check my time <coughs> Doing, I don't hold you, hold you from your lunch too long. Quickly about the microbiome. So if this diagram, and I, I do acknowledge others have uh, provided this information, this, this diagram represents all the sorts of organisms that are around in the world. And yet the ones that we think about, you know, the, the plants, the animals and so on, are just in the green box. So the plants, animals and fungi are all represented in that diagram. So all these others are the microbes. And by any measure, they are the dominant form of life on Earth. So microbes dominate. Okay. So we think we're 100% human. But are we? I put a contention to you that maybe we don't have... Or we aren't the host of bacteria. Um, maybe... You know, we belong to the bacteria more than they belong to us. And here's a bit of logic. That if, if in our, our guts we have 5 to 10% of our body weight, uh, say, uh, a bacteria, doing an important job for us. And, um, but that's okay. So we're 90-95% we're human. But if you look at the number of cells, and let's say I had a trillion cells in me, but that 5 to 10% of microbes might be 10 trillion cells, then I'm actually 90% bacteria by cell number. So now I'm only 10% human. And if I look at the, the puny little genome that I have as a human, you know, a couple of dozen chromosomes, and the paucity of genetic diversity that goes with that, then I look at the millions and millions of, of microbes with a whole fascinating range of genetics that can process just about any molecule you can think of. Well, actually, they're far more important than I am. So the genetic diversity in bacterial populations provides multiple benefits to humans. So are we more bacterial than human? Or at least the healthy ones of us are. And are they our bacteria or are we their humans? And you hear now about, um, uh, you might get, uh, say, Clostridium, Clostridium infections after, say, uh, an antibiotic course, where your gut flora doesn't recolonize and again gets dominated by Clostridium with ongoing health benefits. And now we're talking about taking faecal trans transplants from a healthy human and putting them in, inserting them into the gut of, of a sick human with astonishing results. Interesting, isn't it? And um, I'll, another step of logic, and this logic can all be challenged, I'm sure that maybe we're not so different from plants. I mean, bacteria are important for our health, but is the soil the stomach of the plant? So if I've got my human, I've got my gut, my gut flora, I've got another whole range of, of, of flora all around my skin, a fantastic selection of, uh, of microbes on my skin. Um, 
if I look at the plant, or if I think for a moment, and this is a little bit gross, and I'm sorry to listen to you before lunch, but if I took my gut and my gut flora and I said, look, I no longer want to have it inside me, I want to have it outside me, but I still need the function of all those guts. Effectively, what I've done is I've created a root ball, and it's there, and it's in the soil. I no longer need legs because I can't move, and I've become a plant. And so I become a plant with roots in the soil, and the soil microbiology is critical. It's as critical to a plant as it is critical to me as a human. And of course, the same as a human, then I have bacteria all over my leaf surfaces, and they are critical in actually determining whether or not I've got resistance to leaf diseases and so on. So actually managing the microbiome biome in the roots or the microbiome around the leaf is actually really important in much the same way as managing my own microbiome is. So we're not that different. We've got our, our guts and our roots and our plants in the bacteria are important for very similar things for plants and animals, for growth and development, for uh, nutrient, nutrient acquisition, so whether that's uh, growth hormones or vitamins or um, just general health, or protection from disease we talked about, or resistance to stress, and there's some really interesting stuff, research coming out now about the, the human microbiome, the gut microbiome, actually been related, now I don't have the evidence for this, so I'm just relaying what I hear, but being related to autism staggering when you think about it. So I think we're, we're actually embarking on a journey of, of knowledge, on a, a frontier of knowledge here, that we don't actually understand. And what an exciting time to be a scientist. Just imagine where we're going to be in the next 10 years. We probably can't imagine where we're going to be in the next 10 years. So plants and animals, or humans and, uh, humans and plants, have these same same relationships with bacteria, that microbes are central to our nutrition. Many distinct microenvironments. They're open systems with high surface areas and active communication between the host and the microbes. And once again, there's a whole other fascinating story behind that. So biology is important. So if I go back to one of those original diagrams I showed you about physics, chemistry, and biology, and how we've shifted towards chemistry over time, my contention is that we'll shift back to biology, but we'll now do it with much more understanding. And um, one of the scientists that uh, I was talking to in Sydney recently was telling me that in the year 2000, the, the, um, the genetic analysis that used to cost him $200,000 a sample now costs him two hundred. dollars I think that's something like 10,000 fold reduction in cost. So it means that new technology is opening up the doors to actually study biology in ways we could, we could not dream about 10 years ago. Chemistry was easy. The physics is kind of easy and well proven. We've had this barrier to understanding biology in the past. That barrier has now fallen down. And we've now got methodologies for studying biology. We've got so much data now it's difficult to know what it all means. We're in through the era of big data. But it's fascinating stuff. And it's going to change the way we think about human gut microbiomes or plant root microbiomes. An exciting time. So what can I do about it? I can get passionate about soil, which you might have guessed I might be. You can learn, talk, dig, touch, feel, smell, taste if you want. I would have brought samples if I thought there'd be any volunteers. Um, and I just finished by saying, what else did Roosevelt say? He said that the country needs, and unless I mistake its temper, the country demands bold, persistent experimentation. It is common sense to make a method, take a method and try it. If it fails, admit it frankly and try another. But above all, try something. I guess that's my contention, is that it doesn't matter whether you agree with what I said, but I think it's beholden upon those of us who are stewards of the soil and responsible for producing the food that we expect the community to put in their mouths that it's beholden on us to actually do something about it and try something different because my contention would be that the current system is not sustainable. Thank you.